So why dragons? We know that the Messiah was a dragon. We know that the crocodile was the root of dragon. We know that the dragon order was founded in 2200 BC. We know that the word dragons and pendragons actually come from way back about 3800 BC. Why isn't the symbol a dragon? Why is the symbol this red cross? Well, in actual fact, one discovers that the symbol is a dragon. The red cross, the dew cup, is a dragon. The circle it transmits is a serpent, clutching its own tail, creating everlasting, the unity. So suddenly, the dragon is linked with the dew cup, is linked with the holy grail, and it's why the grail kings were still called in the Middle Ages Pendragons. The symbol was the same, and as one progresses through history and follows the Red Cross symbol, it gradually emerges that this is actually a dragon, and it's more pictorially displayed, but it was always that. It was always a dragon, and the dragon was called Draco. Draco the dragon. It was the emblem of the pharaohs. The dragon, it was the emblem of the Egyptian Therapeutate at Qumran in the time of Jesus. It was the Bistia Neptunis, the great sea serpent of the Merovingian fisher kings in France, and it is the emblem of most of the royal families today, somewhere on their coats of arms, the dragon, Draco. Draco is identical as a dragon with serpent because there's little relation between these fire-breathing, winged dragons that we see in nursery rhyme. The dragon was originally more like a crocodile. It was a four-legged, rather large-snouted serpent. Serpent and dragon were absolutely identical, and it didn't really matter which word was used, it meant the same thing. The dragon, the holy crocodile, the messer, the messiah. The word serpent is used many, many times in the Bible. It starts off with the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent in the garden. Dragon in the garden. Every time we see the word serpent in the Bible, when we look back at the original Hebrew writings to see what it was translated from, it was translated from a word that with vowels in it comes to something like Nahash. N-H-S-H, continentally. The word meant to decipher. It meant to divine. It meant to find out had nothing whatever to do with snakes. The dragon was always he who held the knowledge, he who from one found out, he whom could divine, and that is the root of why we call gods and deities divine, because they held the roots of the serpents, of the Nahash, to the divining, they had the knowledge, they had the knowing, they were the kings, and the serpent of the garden we are told, was Enki. Serpents, from that time on until today, are always, always associated with wisdom and with knowledge. They're not evil. They've never been evil in any law except Christian and Latter-day Jewish law. They were wisdom. They were healing. They were knowledge. It's interesting to discover, once one starts to look, how often serpents and dragons appear in motives of, of healing institutions today. The American Medical Association is actually the plant of life, a tree staff with a widening serpent around it. Once one looks a little further into that, it's more interesting to see that there are more complex medical devices using serpents. The one that we, we, we actually know, perhaps, is the, is the winged caduceus of Hermes with the two coiling serpents around it. This, actually, is not just the emblem of medical associations worldwide today. It was actually one of the earliest symbols of the early dragon court. It was the emblem of the Essene Therapeutate at Qumran at the time of Jesus, and the records tell us exactly what it is. The theory that this is a winged caduceus is a myth. It has very little to do with Hermes or with Mercury. The records tell us that the staff that stands centrally 
is the spinal column. The nervous system are the coiling serpents that go around it. The two wings at the top are the ventricles of the brain, left and right, and that little spot in between is the pineal gland. The gland, the wings, the top of the stem are referred to in the oldest, oldest of law, and even certain yogis and people use the term today, it's called the swan. This was the order of the swan that great grail knights such as Lohengrin and Parsifal belongs to. And it is still a flourishing knightly order today. It is a knightly order for those who are still partaking of the equipment, in today's terms, of starfire. The Rosicrucius, the Dew Cup, the mark of the later Rosicrucians, is all based on starfire ritual. It is why the Christian church, without knowing it, takes us through a ceremony that it doesn't understand when we pretend to drink blood from the chalice. It had all sorts of names. It was nectar of the gods. It was gold of the gods. It was also called the ceremony of the light. Now we're moving into areas that we begin to understand here. The way to the light. Following the light, we suddenly look at the, the, the Essene records and, and the records from the Dead Sea Scrolls and whatever, and suddenly we're into a whole new scheme of operations which is pursuing the roots of the light. The light, when we look back at the old records, actually was the starfire. The starfire is about the acquisition of ability to have special knowledge and wisdom. This is the light. This is the starfire. This is the root to it. And that had gone because it had been taken away. We're now looking for it. The light, it is said, exists in everybody. It simply has to be awakened. There are various ways of awaking it, but the natural way we are told in the oldest records I can find is simply by will. Self-will is the route to the light, a thought-free consciousness, a plane of pure being. And they called this plane of pure being the plane of Sharon. It was actually this very concept of being being through the starfire, being I am that I am, that became the problem for Jehovah when the edict against blood was issued. He said that in the very beginning there was nothing in the universe but peace, that this peace reached everywhere and every one was in peace with everyone else and they talked to God and God answered them in the voice of a small child a very gentle child not much older than themselves because he was speaking to common people and not to great scholars and they were all peaceful until along came Lucifer and Lucifer was self-will and by self-will fell the angel One of the reasons why mistletoe was sacred to the Druids was because many of the priests believed that this peculiar parasitic plant fell to the earth in the form of lightning bolts. Sound familiar? And that wherever a tree was struck by lightning, the seed of the mistletoe was placed within its bark. In the great length of time, the mistletoe remained alive after being cut from the tree had much to do with the veneration showered upon it by the Druids. That this plant was also a powerful medium for the collection of the mysterious cosmic fire circulated through the ethers was discovered by the early priests who believed this and who valued the mistletoe because of its close connection with the mysterious astral light, which is in reality the astral body of the earth. And concerning this, Eliphas Levy writes in his History of Magic 
and I quote, The Druids were priests and physicians, curing by magnetism and charging amulets with their fluidic influence. Their universal remedies were mistletoe and serpent's eggs because these substances attract the astral light in a special manner. The solemnity with which mistletoe was cut down, they believed, drew upon this plant the popular confidence and rendered it powerfully magnetic. Magnetic. The progress of magnetism, they believed, would someday reveal the absorbing properties of mistletoe. So, they understood and believed that they still understand the secret of those spongy growths which draw the unused virtues of plants and become surcharged with tinctures and saviors. Mushrooms, truffles, gall on trees, and the different kinds of mistletoe are employed in the mysteries with understanding by a medical science which will be new because it is old. 